Well, a big aloha and mahalo for doing this. Thank you so much. Appreciate having you on the show. Well, thank you very much for having me. And this is an exciting one for Jerry fans. Uh, and obviously anybody who appreciates his music would know your place in the band for so long that you worked with him and then keeping this music alive. So as we start, tell us who is going to be in the band joining you. Well, I'm going to myself and then I have John Kennelsack. Uh, on guitar, who recently joined us full time, uh, Pete Lavazzoli on drums, and John Paul McLean on bass, uh, Lady T on vocals, and Darling Coleman on vocals. That makes, makes up the band. And were any of these musicians ever in Jerry's band? No, I was the only one. Wow, what a distinction for you after all these years. And I got to confess, man, I saw a bunch of those shows back in the day, so I'm not exactly far into it. Um, and even one time I had you on a, I was at another radio station here in Honolulu. You did a little interview thing with us. It worked out really good back in, uh, I forget what they were promoting back in the day, the Pure Jerry or some sort of record that, that you were oh, on. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And we had had a whole lot of fun. So when you think about the band and this tour you're doing through Hawaii and the material folks oh, may hear over the course of those four shows that you're going to do and in general what you guys play together, if you can sort of describe the eras of Jerry's work that it covers and, and how it's put together. Well, um, I'm not for sure of the era of, of the, the timeline, but uh i am quite aware of one of the cds that they just released last year that was from a hawaii show and i think for sure we're going to be covering covering that cd as many more songs uh, uh that was on that uh, but we cover every last one of songs that we did with jerry uh so i mean i have a a, a song list of 124 songs wow and then we do a few Grateful Dead songs, just a little spice of life for those Grateful Dead fans that love uh, that material. We may, be, we may do two or three a night just as a bonus track, you know. Oh, wow. You're saying you throw in two or three Dead tunes per night just as for bonuses? Absolutely. Wow. People will dig yeah. that. And that is kind of like a little surprise, too. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because we're not known for doing that. So, of course, we try and get some of the favorites and, and do our best to do a very good version of it. Yeah, I remember he used to often close the set down with Deal, as I recall, uh, thinking about those yeah. uh, those shows, and not a ton of other dead tunes. It was nice. He had a real different R&B kind of sound. That Right, right. And we, that's the takeoff. The, that's what we're doing is that gospel R&B sound. And you mentioned the uh, release of the show. You guys played here, was it 90? What was the year? 91? What was the year that you played in Hawaii? Well, I have to look at that record. I, I don't want to start lying on radio. I'm not good with years, <laughs> but I know they just released uh, four or five months ago. Okay. Was it Hilo? That sounds like the right date. Right. I mean, the right city, rather. Um, right, right. And they released a double live record course we're coming over there doing a lot of that material and you had played in honolulu too during that run uh yes we did like two shows basically i as i right. recall we, right we, we did four shows or three shows while we were over there two was honolulu i remember that how cool uh, yeah yeah and so uh they just released the record of, and i hear it i have it and it, it is really good so we're looking forward to come over there and uh reperform some of that material you know and your musical journey and we'll get back to talking about jerry in a moment but one of the reasons obviously that jerry wanted you in the band was your immense talent and what you bring to the table and that began long long before crossing paths with him and i was doing as much research as i could looking into your background and uh -huh. relating to the beginning of your musical journey, it looks like it connects to your father and church, from what I understand, and it led to this incredible talent that so many people appreciate on the keyboards. Tell us the story. Well, uh, my father was took two positions in the church that we grew up in. He was the church clerk, and he did all the, bullet, the bulletins and all that stuff, but he also was the choir director and he could play piano. Sometimes he played piano, but they, uh, other musicians played, and he'd direct the choir. And so there was 
a piano in my house that we grew up on, grew up in. And, uh, and of course, you know, just having something in the house, you know, you just sit down and you just, you know, it's there and you just mess with it. (laughs) (laughs) And and that's kind of what I did. I mean, I couldn't play nothing. And, you know, I remember when I I figured out the chords to one of my first songs, I don't remember the song, but I remember I figured out the chords. And I just played those chords all night long, just playing them chords. I figured this out. And my parents used to tell me, you know, it was a joke, but not a joke. They used to say, okay, it's time to get a piano rest now. You know, I was <laughs> giving a piano rest, but that was a way of getting me off because I'm playing the same chord, you know. But, yes, having a, a piano in the house and my father being a musician and a choir director of the church, uh, you know, then soon, I, you know, just hit me one day. I'm listening to the music. I'm listening to the, the musicians and say, wow, that's really, it just hit me all at one time. And so I, you know, started trying to mess around with the piano when I come home from school, you know, and they were at work and, you know, then I'm, you know, trying to play things that I'm hearing on the radio and stuff like that too, too. I kind of got where I can make sense of it all, you mm-hmm. know, and, 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 and realize that, well, if I stay with this, I can probably play a little bit, you know, and and that's where it all was born and where it all came from. The, the, the desire and the interest was, you know, hit me in church one day. When did the Hammond B3 enter your life? Did they have one, I'm guessing, in the church? Well, it was not a Hammond uh, in the church, but it was an organ. And, <laughs> and again, it, again, you know, um, you know, I, well, first, noticed the piano you know even though there was organ going i noticed the piano first and then uh i think there was a visiting church that came over once and there was a guy uh, i never forget that and man, he played the organ even though it was not a hammer it's like whoa he it's just i i heard the organ that particular day and uh of course i didn't have one so it was a lot harder to try and learn to play organ just kind of jumping on it when you go to church before church starts right. or hanging around after church because I certainly wasn't good enough to play doing church. You know? <laughs> I was not there. And I tried a few times, and they literally asked me off. <laughs> How embarrassing. But I was too young to know I was, I was embarrassing. Was, you know? But, um, uh, and then, you know, my father did see that I had an interest in really wanting to play. And so I remember um, I got a little small organ. You know, it wasn't the Hammond B3, but it was a smaller type Hammond. And I had that for a while and, and, and started learning how to play. And then, you know, finally he saw that really was something beginning to be born there. And uh, then he kind of co-signed. He didn't buy it for me, but he co-signed for me to get uh, a Hammond B3. Your dad you're talking about? And I, yes. And, I, and, and, of course, I paid for it then, you know. I was playing at that point. I was playing in two or three churches that making, you know, kind of no money that I could make to know them or the organ, you know. And, and that's when it was really all over there. I knew that that's what I wanted to do. That's just where I was. When did the Leslie arrive? Did it come with the organ or? Yes. Uh, when uh, uh, when I bought the Hammond B3, uh, you know, at that point, uh, I bought a Leslie with it. Uh, and even though a lot of folks don't know that Leslie was never designed to be with the Hammond B3, that was not their intentions uh, of that Leslie. It was another speaker that no one liked uh, uh, that was made to work with the Hammond. And, some of the, and somehow that Leslie and Hammond got together and and everybody knew it was magic and it was like uh, you just couldn't have a Hammond without Leslie. And, so, you know, of course, when I learned to play, that was, you know, when you bought a ham and there was a Leslie right there that could be bought, too. It didn't come with it. Right. You could buy it. Yeah. And who were the cats? That's such a great um, historical perspective, actually, that you've added. And again, uh, Melvin's growing up in the uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area, right, at the time. During, that is correct. During this. Yeah. So, so I say that in this moment because as you explain that very fascinating background about the Hammond, and not intending to be ma- married to the Leslie, so to speak, but then it becomes the, the the common practice. Who were some of the cats that you would see around you at that point before you had developed any more, just when you had the combination of the two together? Who were some of the cats around there who already were playing that thing that you could look to and be like, wow, that's hip? You know, whether, I don't know the name, you know, whether it would be Greg Raleigh or not. I don't know how it factors into who you saw, but who was it that you saw doing that? 
Well, you know, I, I saw musicians that I didn't know who they were because my family, my father and mother were very strict. They, they were church-bound, and that's all they knew. There was no nightclub and no boogie-woogie that they called back then. Anything other than gospel was boogie-woogie, they called. And so it was none, you know, it was, our life was church, Bible study, and doing the meeting because he was a, the clerk. He had to go there during the week and get the bullet and the board, you know, so, and I'd go with him, you know, to kind of sit and play because that's the only time I could play that organ without a church service because I'd go with him. But I would hear songs. I remember songs and solos, and I still don't know who the the name <laughs> of the musicians but I remember uh, the song "Hold Your Head High" and that organ solo. I don't know, if ever, I don't know the band. Argent. Who it was? Argent. Yes, yeah. the organ solo in that song drove me crazy, as well as Jimmy Smith, Shirley Scott, Johnny Hammond, all of those. But see, that that was jazz, and that was fast action fingers. I didn't have that, you know. Johnny D. Press, press, uh, Johnny D. Now probably be faster. You know, uh, what guided me out was Billy Preston. Mm. He had that church rock and roll soul gospel sound. And so I used to see him on American Bandstand, Shindig, uh, Don Kirshen Rock, comes if you if you know of any of those. Yeah, all of them. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so every now and then, here's this cat, Billy Preston, that came out the church, and, and, and that was my guiding light out because I could play that stuff. I had learned it, but my sweet lord, that was that was gospel, you know. Right, right. And uh, and so I was able to listen to things he did with the Beatles and Ray Charles and Aretha and stuff. And it was just really churchy organ. And so that that's more the style that I even have today. It it, it developed more than that, but that was the guiding light that says, "Oh, you can take these what you're doing here and." a little bit of this element, and, and you're fitted for a whole lot of stuff. And so that's what I came to the Jerry Garcia with, was just really some of the things that Billy Preston played. Did you ever get to interact with Billy through your life and at least tell him this that, the inspiration? Oh, yes, and he didn't like it. Tell me when it happened. Tell the story of when that happened. <laughs> well, it was, uh, um, I was playing with Clarence Clemens. As you know, Clarence played with, El uh, with Jerry for a while, and yep. the year that he played with Jerry, he liked that sound so much that he, he took me out with some other musician, kind of creating that sound. And we went over to Europe uh, with Clarence Clemens. And Billy was over there for some other reason. Of course, Billy played with Clarence and some other configurations, so they knew each other. And so, you know, Billy, uh, Clarence invited Billy down to come, to come down that night. So here's my idol. Here's the, you know, I can't tell you the whole story because he said some things that just not was appropriate, but... <laughs> He did not like me at all. And and, it, and, and and it's funny because I knew his background because I followed Billy Preston. He was he played in the church like I did. And, you know, he was just a little bit a little bit before me. And he played with James Cleveland, uh, Shirley uh, Shirley Caesar, I knew I I knew I went way back with some of that. So I, I, I when we sat down, first off he came in the room and we were sound checking with Clarence Clemens. And they had him come up because he was going to play. And, you know, of course, I'd jump off the organ, off the organ, but he didn't want to play play piano or war with the piano. And so we're playing, and we're doing those things. And, and I know a lot of his. Like, I know his style. That's what, you know, I that's what that's what I grew on. So sure. I'm playing a lot of his stuff, and he didn't like that at all. <laughs> at all. He literally didn't like that. And so, you know, but being being still young in mind and just here's this guy that you just, you've never seen, you've, you've followed him all your life, you know all this stuff. So, at, you know, after sound check, uh, when having dinner, you know, I go and I sit down and kind of sit by him because he just, I don't know, no one more about this guy. And, you know, and so I said a few things, you know, to him uh, that he would know because he did it. And he probably figured no one knows this because I followed him out of the church. And um, and when I said a few things, I said, man, I thank you for just the music lessons. 
I, I don't think I should say what he said to me on the air because I don't know what was all. Well, I, I can ed- like it. I can edit it out. You can say what you want. <laughs> well, he said point blank to me because when he came in, I was kind of playing. You know, I kind of adapted style. And he said word for word after I gave him the biggest compliment in the world. He said, "I thought that shit sound familiar." <laughs> That's what he said to me. Wow! And I was like, oh. I didn't know how to come back from that. Like, uh, okay, you know, but but what it, Billy was not interested in me. There was a you know, if you know anything about Billy, he was uh, bird of another feather, and he was interested in young young men. And so he only stayed there because he was trying to talk to the bass player that he liked. <laughs> Yeah, but he was not interested in anything I had to say. Anything, and so it, it, later on that night, we, we you know the show, the show started, and uh, and they, uh, Billy was on to do uh, uh, get back. I was, Jeremiah was a bull for what, what that song, get back, get back where he wants to go. And so you know, I, I played the organ because he didn't want to play the organ; he just he played the piano. And so we got in a battle. Uh, it, it didn't mean to be that way, but I was a little insulted that what he said to me. So. You know, we got it. You know how key, guitar players, they, they play off each other. They play a lick and the other one play a lick and another play a lick. We started doing that on the keyboard. And because I knew his style, I did it quite well. And because because I kept up with him, the idol, I got the biggest, you know, like he did this and I did his lick. And like, oh, you know, and then he did something. I did his lick. And so it was like the response was kind of going with me, you know. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and oh, did he not like that to the point after so much of that, he jumped up and started dancing, which I can't do any of that. And, you know, he started doing that stuff he does on that song. But and and he just literally stayed away from me the rest of that night. He just, uh, you know, just I, I if I walked through, he walked and walked out of the room. Yeah. But then I learned later on, you know, because I learned it later on more. Billy has a very jealous streak and. He likes a lot of praise and a lot of stuff, and that's just who he is. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that's the most incredible hero encounter I may have ever heard. And just well, if you have one more, you know, uh, that was Billy. Merle Saunders, my I have to say this, just so you know, Merle Saunders is a good friend of mine, and Merle Saunders, you know, he knew he knew Jimmy Smith, and that in the L.A., uh, you know, before he passed, whatever. Uh, they had a Jimmy Smith day in L.A. And Merle was down there. So Merle called me out of the blue. Didn't, I didn't wasn't expecting the phone call. Hey, I want you to talk to somebody. I didn't know who. And they put me on the phone and didn't tell me who it was. Say, hey, yeah, this is Jimmy. Jimmy who? Jimmy Smith. <laughs> oh, you know. And then again, oh, my God. Man, you are the baddest. You are the greatest. And Jimmy said, tell me something I don't know. Oh, just like that. I, and I said, okay, is, is Mel still there? <laughs> like I, I didn't know. I, you know, I don't know where that comes from. I'm none of that. Just like that. He said, tell me something I don't know. And I was through the conversation. And that was the end of that. That was the end of that. He's like, I, you know, yeah, wow. Still, still under the guy. Guy was bad in this time, and he did some stuff. He was a liaison for a lot of people and stuff he did. But you know those those that those attitudes. What about the young kids that uh, look up to you? And 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 I try hard to be none of that, none of that, because I just think that's so wrong. It's really harsh to hear too. Um, and a, a lot of this, just backing up a moment, is uh, kind of par for the course with this business. Another San Francisco cat who is in that world would be Bill Graham. And like when I was young, this is just an aside yeah. to show you how, how the, I, I understand how this goes. I remember reading that Bill Bill Graham book. And when you get to the chapter about his dealings with Led Zeppelin and, and everything that happened in 1977, with the attack on one of his employees and stuff, it's similar to what you're saying. It's almost like when you get through reading that, you can almost, it's hard to get back to that music once you've kind of seen oh, yeah. Yeah. seen what the inside of it is like. So when you say those two stories, um, 
as shocking as they are, it's not a total surprise, but they are. But it, but but also what you said too about you're a young guy and you 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 obviously weren't doing it because you were trying to rip anything off of them. Like you said, oh, you're you're oh, inspired by them. You love them. That's how. That's right. a, a way you were showing how much you love them, and and uh, that, those are just incredible. I mean, I. I I, I, you can't add to, to it to that. You'll leave people um, thinking for a long time <laughs> on, both, on, on both of those uh, things. And when I when I was looking at some of your other encounters, which uh, I am going to hope people were treating you better in some of these other situations, Melvin, I'm certainly ho hoping uh, you worked in this group. Oh. <laughs> and I know you did. I know you had a lot of a lot of good encounters. But one thing that was cool to read about Gideon and Power, I guess it was called, had Mickey Thomas oh, yeah. of Elvin yeah. Bishop, Jefferson Starship. He would eventually be in those bands, but beforehand he was in this. And this is a, an early project for you. And and ironically, the manager of that has some strong connections. That was Wally Amos of Famous Amos Cookies, who was a Hawaii resident. Yes, yes. Well, the cookie came a whole lot later. I guess <laughs> as a manager, I guess he failed. <laughs> he went off in Hawaii and made a cookie, and then he's like, whoa. <laughs> that was one of your first yeah. pro gigs, though, huh? Oh, yes. That was the, 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 first, the first time our airline ticket was, was bought for me to fly to do a concert. And it was uh, uh, Arizona. Where I don't remember the idea where it was, but I knew it was Arizona. They bought my ticket. I flew, and I played with Gideon and Power. Uh, one show and came back the next day. That was and that was just like you know when you work hard trying to be a musician, you dream about it, and and you and these little garage house bands getting out of school, and you guys rehearse forever, and you never do a gig, you know. And then the first thing happened, and that was the first thing that happened for me on the professional side that I literally got paid for outside of playing in churches, but those were not professional scenes. They were just like you know in the church that grew up in the church sure but that was the first thing outside of the church that i did that i got paid for and it was well and was and they really liked what i did you know and that led to you working with elvin bishop i guess yeah that that went for gideon you know so it's, a, it's a, a long story the beginning was roommates with elvin before he had the hit around and so in love and still in watermelon so i think was the first kind of hit then fool around and they were roommates. And so I'm playing with Gideon and Power and, the, you know, connections to connections to connections to connections. Yep. All that was all through connection, um, knowing someone that heard someone and knowing someone that heard someone. And it just went from there, from uh, Maria Mordauer, same thing, a connection that came down to a Broadway play that I did with uh, John Hendricks' Evolution of the Blues and Maria Modara Boyden with John Kahn, the bass player in Jerry Garcia band. Right. And it's, it's, it's all connected. It's amazing how that works. And it's really a testament to the, it's a kind of a lesson that, uh, it's really important even for people like maybe who it's hard to network and push yourself to do that. There's a, you're, you're kind of like the, the lesson in the school book as to the value. Like if you do it, then this is what can happen. If you, if you can talk to people and, and let those connections kind of come. Oh yeah. Yeah. You just never shut down any doors. Anytime someone says, Hey man, you guys, you would be interested in playing another band and and maybe doing a few, oh, yeah, call me, call me when you, you know, and just you just open up all those doors because one day you get those phone calls. And it could, you know, I totally forgot about some of the things that I said, oh, yeah, give me a call. And one day I got a phone call like, oh, I don't remember much, of, but okay, you know. And, uh, and, and, and the story just went on from there. I was not a kind of guy that hung out at, clubs and hung out at gigs and meeting musicians and talking my way into that stuff. I was not that guy. I, a phone call came to me or a connection or someone of some sort reached out to me. I was not good in trying to sell myself. Right. I get you. No. So then it's even more of a, of a lucky break that those connections would manifest rather than you working it to make him to make them uh, happen. And that's a, you mentioned Merle and, and again, Merle Saunders, legendary keyboardist who, had a huge place in Jerry's heart and a big role in in helping Jerry to recover after one of his medical emergencies in the mid 80s. Um, but it looks like from my reading and you'll correct me if I have it wrong and forgive me if I do, but it looks like the story of first meeting Jerry 
Merle had something to do with that, basically. You kind of explained it with the John Kahn thing there, but explain it again. Well, Merle and I, we knew each other, you know, keyboard player in the Bay Area, keyboard, I'm a keyboard player. I was playing with uh, Elvin Bishop when Merle was playing with Jerry. I didn't know who Jerry was, you know, but we used to talk about uh, how it is on the road with those guys, you know, how he, he would talk about the travel, you know, on the phone and then what, and, and, and that, you know, my travel with, with Elvin, you know, I was, they really appreciated me uh, at this, this level of my life. I'm, now starting to play pretty decent and and uh i you know what i came to the band with is kind of a r&b soul rock gospel you know feel into that rock it gave it a sweetness you know that that church soulful feel uh and again it was what i a lot learned from you know again billy Preston. so you know i played with uh elvin bishop for a good six years you know and and Merle and I would talk, and, you know, we actually wind up forming a production company called MS Production, because Merle signed as a Melvin Seal. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> so we had a, a, a production called MS, and we would, you know, I had a recording studio, and we'd produce group, and we'd work on different people albums together. But, it, it, you know, ironically, he would tell me about Jerry, and, like, I, I didn't know who he was, never, I don't remember his name, and uh, um, and when I got with him, they wouldn't let me hear any of Merle's tracks. But how I got one, ironically, is I was playing with Elvin Bishop somewhere in San Diego. I remember that very well. And Jerry Garcia Band was a headliner. I never saw Jerry, never came out the dressing room when I when we were playing. But when I got with him, I remember he, he told me he had heard me play before. And I was like, really? You know, let's do it. And he told me when and where. And he asked. Uh, he asked John and them, you know, who was that? I don't think Murrow was with him at that time, because Murrow would have came out and talked to me. I might have Mickey Hopkins or one of the other guys. But he asked who was on the organ wow. at that time. And when I got with him, he reminded me of that. Well, I never saw him. He never came out of the dressing room, but he was paying attention. Such an honor to hear that. Wow. Yeah, man, Totally. I mean, that it yeah. would make that kind of impression. And, uh, well, you know what's kind of weird, though? Not weird, but synergy. When you think about, and again, for people who don't know the Jerry Garcia band, very R&B flavored, very different than the Grateful Dead in a lot of ways. He would make it kind of right. psychedelic. He would jam it out. But there were just tons of covers, how sweet it is, and, and then other I... covers, too, like Jimmy Cliff, Harder They Come. I mean, and, and Jerry would weave it together in this thing that had a very R&B kind of flavor and very soul flavor. So when you talk about him liking what you did, once you know the Jerry Garcia band sound, it kind of, I guess, makes total sense. Because, I mean, obviously for Jerry to have a band that sounded like that, he was doing it because he wanted it to sound that way. And so when he heard a guy That's like right. you, it was just, you obviously would just fit that it perfectly. It would be like, he would say, oh my God, this guy is like me. He, he plays the kind of music I like and he'd be a good fit for me kind of thing. Uh, so it, it, right. it, it completely makes sense uh, the way, you know, now that I know a lot more ab about your background and, and getting to know this cat who you would end up doing 15 years of, of touring with him, correct? Uh, it was really just under 18. Under 18. Okay. So quite, quite a long, uh, <laughs> quite a long run, <laughs> run of dates. So, so yeah. ba basically a long, a long chunk of time. So when you, yeah. when you first get into the band, um, and, and you, so he's, he's reached out to you. Like, so when, when did he call, make the call and say, Hey, I, I want you to join the band itself. Well, it, 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 it was John Kahn, and that's back to that opportunity. John Kahn being Maria Mordauer, boyfriend at the time. And when her, when I was playing with her, and sometimes her bass player couldn't make John fat in. So, you know, I met John, and he did gigs with us periodically, and he was paying attention. And and, and, and he, one day, you know, after a number of gigs, he said, hey, man, would you be interested in maybe doing some gigs with another band? Never told me who it was, never anything about it. Just again, yeah, man, I love to. Just, just, just give me a call, you know. <laughs> and, and one day I got that call, and he says, "Hey, you know, uh, we want to try and get together." Uh, it was a Friday. Uh, it was a Thursday, Thursday evening, uh, and just kind of maybe doing some rehearsal and see if we can put some gigs together. 
and you know gave me an address and where to be and and that was that was the launching of the Jerry Garcia band with me even though I had no clue of who it was anything about the music nothing and I said something early that I didn't finish that's a whole meeting introduction of what happened there when I came to that rehearsal and walked into Front Street, which is, was the Grateful Dead warehouse where all the gear and the studio and all that stuff was. That's a long story. And you probably heard it because I've said it and it's been broadcast and written in books. But what I mentioned earlier, once I did that and, and Jerry, you know, we went up there and we played How Sweet It Was, How Sweet It Is, and uh, uh, Second Night Emotion, the Motown stuff something that everybody kind of would know, you know, to be able to play some songs. Sure. And we played about three songs, and they, they took a break and went out, and and, 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 they, and that was the beginning of me being in the band. Um, and so immediately, you know, we did some gigs. Uh, uh, um, I think it was in San Francisco or uh, in Berkeley, Keystone. It was Keystone. It was the first set of gigs. And I remember when I was going up there for the rehearsal and learn a lot of the songs of the Jerry Garcia uh, style songs, I wanted to, because I knew Merle had played with them. Now now I realized this is that guy Merle was talking about. I, all that was in the place. But they wouldn't let me hear nothing. I'm like, you know, let me hear how Merle approach this song. Cause they were new to me. I didn't know these songs. I was not a deadhead. I knew nothing of what was going on besides I was a musician. And they literally didn't want me to hear Merle. I get, I get it now because if I had heard what Merle did, I would have figured out that's that's the comfort level of what they want to hear, and I would have played what Merle played. I would have just picked up, you know, the, the notes they were doing and the rhythm and the style, and kind of given as much as Merle as what they were used to. But they wanted the opposite. They wanted how I would approach the song. So they really wouldn't let me hear anything. <laughs> so that's where I just did what I thought was right. You know, and and that's what Jerry wanted was what I brought to the table. It's incredible that uh, the way that they would do that sort of thing. And I get it because... Um... Had you done that, you would have just tried to mimic Merle and tr because that's what they wanted. So you would just give them what they wanted. And it was neat that they right. uh, they allowed you to shine in, in that way. And right. and then in terms of the set, like when you first when we were talking about when we were talking about your how you interpret doing this, you know, with, with the band yourself that you've got. And you had like 120 something songs that, that you've guys you guys have because you're kind of doing it after the fact. You're looking back at all this work. You can put it all together when you get back to that beginning period when you first got into the band you know like past the first uh the first encounter when you actually are like okay now i'm going to be in the band when it came to rehearsing how did jerry tell you like okay these are going to be all the tunes like what when did he how, how and when did he show you what what the repertoire was about to be at that very first part of the touring well a lot of that was john Kahn. john would write little charts I got just it. Just chord progression, not not much, just something that you could follow. And I was able to read little charts, and so you know we'd have rehearsal, and and uh, like uh, part of it come, and he'd have just a kind of chord progressions of how it goes, and we'd play the groove, and and I was really yellow. I you know when I first started, I just was you know I probably was horrible, you know, because <laughs> I was scared, and I didn't I I never played because I'm fresh out of the church. Remember this. <laughs> Don't you know? I've done a few things, but still, I'm I'm church boy, and I produced gospel at the gospel record company. I was still a lot of that was there, so you know, he, I didn't know how to approach some of these songs. I just you know, kind of was back then a lot more greener than I am now. Uh, I just kind of played the chords and and stayed out of Jerry's way as much as possible, you know. <laughs> uh, and that's why I wanted to hear Merle because I didn't know what to play. And if I had, I heard him, I didn't know what to play. But, you know, they they allowed me to just figure out what I thought it should be like, you know. And and as I started getting more aggressive and more confident, you know, and and John and Jerry smiling at me, so I'm figuring they must like it. You're doing something right. <laughs> I'm doing something right because I don't know. And, you know, and so that's how it went. I just... I just got aggressive in what I thought is how I thought it should be. I never had another keyboard player to 
bounce off of. Oh, that's how it goes. No, no. And were, yeah. were you using more than just the hand, like on stage, what was your gear besides the Hammond or was it the, like describe your gear that, that you brought out there with you basically? Well, uh, it was, it was definitely the Hammond and there was various different synthesizers ah. that was all emulating the piano sound at that point. It wasn't uh -huh. a lot of synthesizer, but it was piano sounds that I was grabbing from another keyboard. Got it. Uh, and there was three or four different ones that, you know, and the only thing was like either Fender Rose or piano. I was never really synthesized or weird sounds or things like that. It's a vintage uh, keyboard sound, you know. One of the other cool things about when this was happening in your life was this is an era when, I mean, the Grateful Dead had already been, had been a phenomenon for a very, very, very long time. But aspects of that phenomena began to be much more pronounced in the 1980s. And I'm referring to the fact that by the time you start with this guy, the Grateful Dead were doing something that, to the best of my knowledge, no other band ever did, which is a huge, huge cultural thing that they did, which was mm -hmm. they allowed fans to basically camp and vend in the parking lots of their shows. I mean, by today's standards, this is just almost a most unheard of reality. But <laughs> at, the, at the time, and you know what I'm talking about, but I have to explain it because people, yeah. you know, people driving down the road are like, what is he talking about? So what, what, yeah. what was happening then was the, the band would, would load into town, let's say for two or three nights, maybe four nights at an arena or wherever the venue was. And thousands of people were allowed to enter either the parking lot of the venue or nearby parking lots. They'd pay an expanded ticket, uh, an expanded parking fee, and they could basically camp for several days on end. I mean, living in the parking lot yeah, outside, yeah, yeah. <laughs> outside of the show. And I did some of this myself, which is why I can kind of, uh, I realize the the significance and the specialty of it. And so dialing back to yourself, as, as I'm trying to paint this picture, this is occurring on the Grateful Dead side. And when Jerry decided he wanted to break from the dead or whatever, he would do his own band and then, and then you guys would go out. So my question would be, as that phenomenon was occurring, when did it occur to you that like, wow, my new boss has a really unusual other gig. I mean, really unusual. You know, it's funny because I was, as green as green can be. Uh, uh, I, I literally didn't know who Jerry was. You know, living and growing up in San Francisco, I knew the name Grateful Dead because, you know, whenever one of the members, say, for instance, that you hear on Channel 7 News, today is Mickey Hart's birthday from the Grateful Dead, he made blah, blah, blah. You hear that. You hear that. And the other thing I heard is somewhat what you just described. Uh, and when they would do the Oakland Arena Auditorium, whatever they did at New Year's time, it was in Oakland. And you would hear the cluster of the of the uh, the neighborhood didn't like this hippie crowd, <laughs> what you just described. And so that was all over the news. You know, they, they, you hear people talking how it, this is, you know, different ways how they was displeased of what was going on, which is exactly what you just said. How they're just camping out and living in the parking lot or anywhere near the venue because, you know, they three or four shows, New Year's, you know, New Year's running right there in Oakland. So I only knew the name Grateful Dead, didn't know not one fan member because I was not a deadhead. I didn't know nothing about it. That's just for catching that on the news. <laughs> and so, you know, it took a minute because even at the first rehearsal, the first rehearsal that I, I, I was speaking about, you know, we went in and, and of course, I knew John Kahn. He's, he's the one that invited me to come do it. And he sat in with Maria a lot. And so, you know, I was there on time. I got there, you know, whatever time it was, I'm, I'm always wanted to make a good impression. I got there and I got there before all they came in. And so you know how you meet a bunch of folks and it's short-term memory. You, you, you hear the name, but... Ten minutes later, you couldn't cite everybody's name. Right. I could. So they all come in. I'm already in the building. The, 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 the person that keeps the watch over the warehouse let me in and was expecting us. And so they all come in, Jerry, John Kahn, Greg Rico, the drummer that was with Flystone, and, and four or five other people. And, and so I come in and, hey, you know, I'm, I am Melvin Melvin to all these people. 
But all those names are thrown at me. Well, in there was Jerry names. <laughs> but I didn't, you know, I couldn't repeat it again. And so we go through that formality. Then we, you know, go in and say, hey, let's just go play some music. We go into the little area where the, 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 the instruments were, and we all played. And like I said, we did How Sweet It Is, Second That Emotion, some Motown stuff, something that kind of everybody would kind of know so we could play. Did three songs. And they all disappeared for a few minutes, and then we met back in the lobby. <laughs> and it took a while to figure what all that was about. <laughs> I'm green now. Remember this. And, and but even going into it, you know, let me get to when I first walked in the building, I was a little afraid, a little uncertain, <laughs> because here's all these backdrops, and they all got to deal with skeletons, right. and I'm fresh out the church, and the skeleton, and, and that don't go together. Right. You walk, I'm walking, I'm looking at this skeleton with a violin in his hand, skeleton with a uh, rose coming out of his head, and just all these different backdrops, you know. And I, and I remember, I, don't, I literally don't know nothing. And to make it even more scary, it wasn't too long before Jim Jones had that massacre. Right, right. So I'm walking into something and went, what in the hell is going on here? Looking around, and you know, and you might see a hundred dollar bill wrapped up with some cocaine in it. Right. Like, what fool? <laughs> I'm not trying to tell nobody, but it was strange. But anyhow, so we go in and we rehearse these songs, and three songs, and we come out, and they all disappear from it, and we come back in the lobby, and dumb me, I'm, you know, I was impressed with Jerry's guitar players. I said, hey, man, you play some pretty good guitar. <laughs> You know, and everybody just got a good laugh. Steve Paris, everybody was laughing at me because they knew I knew nothing. <laughs> and so the guitar player says back to me, "You play some pretty good organ." <laughs> it was because it was Jerry, and uh, it was born from that. I knew nothing, and they actually liked the fact I knew nothing because I wasn't trying to take pictures with this guy. I was not trying to ride with him in the limousine. I was not trying to. I knew nothing. It was just a gig. It's just a gig, and I had no idea for three weeks before I started saying, realizing who he was. It, it, you know, it's, it, I'm looking at the crowd, and how, how are all these people being here, and we just rehearsed and put a band together. So I didn't know it went on with, you know, other ways, and, and so it, you know, grew and grew, and, and as it grew, uh, then I saw, oh, this is Eric, he's even the Grateful Dead, oh, my God, you know all the embarrassing moments, but, you know, they, they, they were fine with all that. And so I quickly learned, you know, uh, to the degree of uh, what I was involved with. But it was it was pretty scary there for a moment because I didn't know. I just didn't know. They were the kindest people in the world. I knew that, but still, you know. The imagery you're talking about, what you're pointing out, and it's a great point, is for people who were uninitiated and didn't know didn't know how gentle and soft the music was and that it wasn't really aggressive music at all, but the imagery of all the skulls, and it looked very, very different from the outside. Yeah. W without knowing, yeah. you would have thought, what on earth is their attachment to death, you know, and stuff. Yeah. And, yes, yes, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I was not attached to death. I want to live. <laughs> exactly. No, I can, I mean, that that's part of the phenomenon of the whole thing. And getting back to what I was describing, I mean, there, the, it, it's, I mean, and you've done this now for a long time you you've you've, oh, yeah. you've gone way past you know i mean god bless him Jer jerry is past yeah. but when you think back yeah. to i mean you got to witness so as the 80s progressed this phenomenon that i described became such a gigantic thing that by 1989 it had become a do or die moment and the band had these little newsletters they would hand out in, in the crowd for free and they would try to tell people hey look you got to clean this scene up because in a moment we're not going to be welcome back. We're not going to have camping and, right. and vending. And 1989 rolls around. That was the year, the big uh, the year everything really changed. Prior to it changing, can you remember any kind of like interesting, like, like as by then you knew what was going on at his at his day job and and, and to some degree oh, yeah. it, it would happen at at his shows too do you ever oh, yeah. do you ever remember like talking to him about that phenomena and just because as you can imagine 
if I had the chance to interview every single major performer of all time, uh, un unless I've been missing something in my nearly 50 years alive, there isn't another band that allowed such a phenomenon to occur. So thinking of your time with him, did he? Did, was it ever a discussion you guys had where he, where he confided in you just how maybe overwhelming it was or maybe it was flattering or just any perception he had about it? It, it was small conversations and it was more he had the most the utmost respect for me because I did nothing I, I don't even think I was drinking wine back then and he I loved did. that huh and, and 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 it was all around me they would just hey Melvin take this and they would tell Melvin don't take that you don't want that right I don't even know what it is you know it, no no don't, don't, don't take anything for friends fans don't, don't drink anything and you know they had to tell me don't you know because i don't know you know i don't know but uh he had that respect because uh i was green i was literally green and just using you think at my age you nobody's green like that i was green to that that world i was because the few professional things i i did was nothing like Cherry. Elvin Mitchell was Elvin Mitchell was no comparison yeah, right. <laughs> Broadway plays and Gideon Power. Oh, none of that at all. So that was another world, you know. And and they and they knew I was, you know, I, I didn't know much and, and they helped kind of because I like I was sometimes the only one that had my had my own dressing room. Because they all would get together and, and they didn't want me in the dressing room when that was being done. Are things being done? Right. Oh, well, that so says they, a lot. Melvin, well, well, you're down the hall. I go down the hall, and and to showtime, I I would not hang out down there. You know. They were keeping you safe from. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. From yeah. what was just so, a. Uh, I mean, did you go to any of those giant stadium shows and ever see him do his gig with the Dead when you were doing your own gig with him? Like, did you ever stop in at any of those big shows just to take in the experience of it? I think. Two times, perhaps three, for sure two. And he, he literally invited the Jerry Garcia band. Uh, one was uh, the Oakland Arena, uh, one of those uh, New Year's show. And I, I remember very well Dr. John, I think, was on the bill. Okay. Uh, I don't, can't quote the year, but I know Dr. John was on the bill. And he invited us down to come come to the show. Not not to do anything, just he invited us to come to the show. And, and so, you know, Jerry invited us. We went. I, I go on. Jackie, me, Glory, we all went. Uh, you know, a lot of times John Conn was always around places like that. And I listened, you know, uh, to uh, some songs, maybe maybe half of a set. It was just not my scene. <laughs> and I left. And this was even after being with Garcia, you know, for <laughs> quite a few years. But it was just nothing, you know, it was just like, okay. They were a lot different from us. A lot different, you know, the, the psychedelics and the jams and with the rhythmic things they did where we were more R&B-ish and totally. a lot of, and, and it was just different. So it was just, I, I didn't find a lot in it that kept me there. Any stadiums though, like the big outdoor ones? No, no. It was, wow. like, it was definitely the Oakland, uh. I think it was the auditorium or which it was Oakland. I, don't know no, I get you. So it was indoor arena show. So you never got to see yeah. him do one of those big 80,000, 60, 70,000 seat Grateful Dead shows. You never saw one. I never saw one. Amazing. I knew he, I knew he did it. Yeah, and yeah. We did. We started doing a lot of those same places, NASA, uh, Madison Square Garden, the, uh, the place in L.A., uh, I forget the name of the... The Forum? Uh, yeah, the Forum, yeah. You know, we got where we would sell it out one... I know the Grateful Dead did it several nights. Sell it out, but we got to the level where we were doing those same places one night and doing quite well, you know. and, and But that was the biggest uh, that I, you know, what we did. Of course, I was not following the Grateful Dead, so... Being in San Francisco, that's why I was able to go to go over to the Oakland show. I drove over there, but yeah, yeah. anywhere else, that would have been a flight for me or, or a long drive to see that, and that's like was not my cup of tea. That's really it's great to know, though. I mean, it really helps to flesh out because you're such a critical figure in his life, and it shows yeah. the, the role that you played. And he must have really appreciated that you were fresh to this and that you were not part of a lot of that. He wanted to keep you safe. I really admire the way that you. You sort of d describe him. And you mentioned Clarence earlier, 
And uh, ironically, in that same year, which ends up being the, the uh, it's not the finale of the, the Jerry tours. You guys would tour several more times after that. But certainly everything relating to the Grateful Dead took on a different tone after 1989 because that's when things uh, became much more serious in terms of they banned camping and vending. So, but that, yeah. same, that same fall... In the fall of 1989, you guys did a, uh, a very memorable tour in, in the Northeast for a portion of that tour only, but for many shows in a row, I think at least five, six, I don't know how many, Clarence Clemens just, and you got to remember, this is before the internet, this is before the way you can get information so quickly these days, and so as a, right. as a fan, you're like, wow, I didn't know Clarence Clemens was going to be in the band, and he, he didn't stay for the whole tour, he did several several dates, um, but do, right. can, do you remember that particular um, thing happening, and, and was, was that the kind of thing where you knew in advance he was about to come be with the band, kind of flesh out the behind-the-scenes details that I don't know of what happened? Well, yeah. Well, the first time he came and sat in, I think he just came and he sat in and played. And, you know, uh, he took a liking to the sound uh, a lot. And, of course, you know, Jerry and them always welcomed the, uh, you know, celebrities, people in the same profession, no matter what they play, you know. And uh, I mean, after he sat in and, you know, I, I, behind the scenes, I, I was not there when they talked about him coming out. But it was that he was going to join us for quite a few shows, and he did. He did a little run with us, and uh, I remember. Uh, was it, was did he go to Hawaii? I don't. I don't know if he came to Hawaii. Yeah, yeah, he came to Hawaii. Yes, yeah, he was. Yeah, because that's when Clarence talked to me about going to Europe with him. I think it was towards the end of his run, uh, sitting with the Garcia band, and he, you know, he had his own band, but uh, it was in between, uh, uh, just not working, and he liked that sound uh, that we. You know, the Garcia band so much that he asked me to go to Europe with him and, and play with him and uh, in, in the things that he was doing. There. And that's when that incredible encounter with uh, with Billy oh, Preston God. happened. And I don't yeah. mean incredible like in a good way, but just like. In yeah. <laughs> it really was. And I had an audio tape of that. It was on a DAT tape for years. I may still have it, but I don't have a DAT tape. But, you know, I go back and I listen to that battle. I listen to, you know, the, what, what we talked about it. It was so real. And it's like, I did a pretty good job. But, you know, he, I studied him from the very beginning. And he, and he just, you know, he, he had no knowledge of me, but I had all the knowledge of him. <laughs> his mother, his, his sister, I knew his lifestyle. I knew him from a distance, you know. It's incredible. Yeah, but that that's. That's what happened. It was uh, through Clarence that took me over to Europe. And, and that's when that happened then. So that's about after that fall 89 tour, basically. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Wow. There's all kinds of stuff uh, that, that we've learned today. And, and when you think back of, of uh, you mentioned guests, you mentioned how Jerry would be a welcoming figure. And, and with so many years of having done that band, if you were to look at highlights uh, of that privileged time that you had, and, and, and certainly for all the Grateful Dead fans, they would just be drooling to have gotten to do what you got to do, which was be part of his band and be someone he really loved and protected, too, from, from the way you're describing it. But in the overall arc of those experiences, Mel, and when you point at the shows and think of special encounters that maybe stick out through so many different experiences, what are some that come to mind? Well, uh, one of one of the other shows, and he played with us, played with us once or twice, was Bruce Hornby. Hornsby. I remember. I think it was NASA. It was a large coliseum. I, don't, I think it might have been NASA or something. But he came out and he sat in on the piano and. I think he was doing some work with the Grateful Dead. I'm pretty sure he was. Um, and he came out and, and sat in with us. So and we were in his hometown, I believe, or he just was there. But of course, you know, uh, I knew who he was from his hit. Uh, you know, that's just the way it is. Bruce Hornsby, you know, he's a great musician. But that particular encounter was not good for me because he played a lot. He played a lot of notes. He played, you know, I would think when a musician sit in with someone, they would just play more careful and leave more room. He played a lot of notes. And I just kind of sat back because we would have been fighting each other if I would played what I'd been playing with Jerry. So I just really uh, sat back and just let him shine, you know, let him do what he does, you know. Of course, he's Bruce Hornsby, so. Right, right. You know, no skin off my back, you know. <laughs> 
But I really enjoyed the fact that I sat on stage with him, you know, and uh, had a chance to, you know, we were both playing for the same guy for a couple of shows. Uh, that's interesting. So that's one that sticks out. And so there weren't a lot of other guests, though, huh, that um, that came along, I guess, the way that Clarence oh, there did. Was, there was guests, uh, I think, with Morris Salas, and uh, there was a bass player, and uh, I forget which one it was. <laughs> but they, they were... They were all kind of around the Grateful Dead around that time. And so, you know, whoever was kind of popping their head in around the Grateful Dead came out to a Garcia band show. Right. You know, I get so it. We kind of, yeah, it was more of that kind of a thing. They, not that they did a lot of gigs, but they, they came in for a show or two or something like that. It's incredible. It's an incredible experience uh, that you've had. And as we go to wrap it up, um, thinking about this guy who you've described him in such loving terms, too, and it kind of fills... At least in a lot of ways, it fits the description that most people sort of have of Jerry Garcia. And certainly, um, it was very clear how much he loved you on stage, at least as a fan. I only yeah. I only got to see him eight or nine, uh, eight, nine, something like that, times solo. Um, and every time when you would solo... I, you know, I mean, you just watch him looking at you with that big smile. He clearly, clearly, there was, there was just no question that uh, he yeah. he loved your playing. He, he loved being with you. And, and that smile is such an infectious, warm smile. I mean, just thinking of it now makes you feel a little better when you think of that, that endearing look that he would give you, which was just so kind and gentle and yeah. encouraging and loving. And yeah. over all those years off stage. What kind of relationship did you have, and are there off stage, away from the stage moments that you treasure or hold dearly that also kind of show Jerry in that that warm light? Well, I have the utmost respect for Jerry, but you know there there are things that Jerry did that people would never know. You know, you hear the story of you hear the turn of this guy to give you the shirt off his back. You know, Jerry was really that guy. And and I'll, I'll give you two uh, examples. Uh, I know once Glory was uh, trying to buy a house. And, uh, you know, of course, she, she was not able to qualify for financing. And Jerry financed the house, he used his credit. She paid for it, he paid him back. But he put up for her to get this house. People never, never would know that. Right. You know, there was a keyboard that I wanted. It was a Cursor called Cursor 250. And when it first came out, it was very, very expensive. You know, and, and so I'm, you know, I was playing uh, at that time. At that time, I think it was an emulator. It was called an emulator. Some of the piano sounds you heard on Dear Prude and a few things was this thing. So this Cursor will come out and, uh, uh, you know, I said, Jerry, man, Love you on a Kershaw. It's well. What is the cause? It's Kershaw 250. I think it was about in two weeks they had bought bought it for me for for the band for me to play for the band. You know, of course, but sure. You know, the thing was, I don't even want to talk about money. How much money it was, and it got it because I wanted to play it with the band. It was the new thing, and I thought I could. It would help me shine with this group. And he went out and told Steve they got it brand new and had it delivered to my house because I had to learn how to operate it. You know, you just don't see this kind of keyboard on stage. You have to learn. And I I took it out the box. Unbelievable. I mean, that says a lot. Yeah. It's, you know, things like that, that that's never told the Gloria thing. No one knows. that. I know it. Jackie knows it, you know, but I don't think I've ever heard it again. It just signs of how much he cared, and uh, and it sounds like from what you're saying that really your times together were limited to just doing the gigs. Like it doesn't sound like he would. You guys got to spend a lot of just completely unmusical time off stage, or do I have it wrong? Well, it was some, but um, it was more like in the lunch area. I, like I said, I didn't hang out in Jerry's room. They always, almost always, made sure I had a room. Uh, you know, and, and like at the Warfield, we did a lot. I had a room while we were down at the, the other end. But, you know, when we go with lunch after a sound check and, and lunch or dinner is there, you know, that's, we'd be, you know, all this. I came in the room to find out what songs we were doing tonight. He would write a little set list. But I literally didn't hang out there. 
But, you know, I've been in limousine. I've been in Learjets with Jerry. I mean, I rode with him. I was with him all the time. But I was a little bit of a different cup of tea. And I just didn't want to get in his way or make him feel funny in any kind of way. So it was, it was me. It wasn't that Melvin don't come in here. It was that I was giving them their space. I get it. And he needed it because he was at the center of the cyclone, huh? I mean, he, what an unusual person to be. I mean, he was just like elevated beyond the stature of a regular guy. Because when, when I first went to those shows, dude, I was into heavy metal and stuff. And I would go to those shows mostly because everyone was partying so hard and people were selling yeah. all kinds of interesting things. Wink, wink, oh, nod, yeah. nod, nod in the parking lot. And so I didn't come as like a fan of that music. And that was one of the first impressions I had without knowing anything about the dude was like, because if you don't know anything and you're in a parking lot of like JFK Stadium, let's say in Philly, and there's 80,000 people and all you see is his face everywhere. Every other shirt has a different interpretation yeah. of his face. You yeah. know, you just kept seeing this guy's face everywhere you yeah. turn. And it was like, whoa, this is a little heavy. Who, You know, you, if you don't know anything, you, it's almost like a cult. Yeah. When you see the way it was. Right. Yeah, that's, <laughs> what, that's what I was trying to say in the beginning. Like. It, it hit me kind of like, I didn't know what was going on. It was just like, it was, whoa. And I, <laughs> I entered into this very careful. <laughs> you know, but the outcome of it is, it's funny. You know, I, I come from a world of church and gospel and rock and roll and, 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 and soul and R&B. And from the time I got with Cherry, who turned my world around, that's all I play now. And all that I was doing when I met him, this is all I've been, what I've been doing for my life with Jerry and since his passing, this is all I'm doing. He reshaped your life and he seized he on my life. He's like, and you know, I know more about the songs and how they should be approached than I did with Jerry because when I played with Jerry, it was all about Jerry. It didn't matter. I didn't, you know, he's over there singing. I don't know the words of the song. I don't, I can't hear what he's saying. It didn't matter. It's <laughs> just learn, but, but when he passed, I had to learn these words to make sure the people I brought in is singing it right. I had to know now. Like, well, what was he saying? What's the story of this song? Right, right. Angle up in blue. You know, all those words. I had to learn the story. So, so then the people that I brought in to be part of this band make sure they're doing it right. So I know more about it now than I ever knew. And it totally makes sense. Totally makes sense. I mean, you think it's been a longer time since he's passed than when he was alive. I mean, it's like you, you've you eclipsed the time that you spent working with him when he was alive. You have kept the tradition and the music alive for a longer period of time now. Yes. Yes, I have. You're right about that. And, and again, like I said, this is uh, all I play. And people that hire me and want me to sit in or do a little run is all the same. See the Grateful Dead and Jerry Garcia. Uh, it's that's what I'm doing. So you know, uh, I'm trying my best to put a little record together because I do write songs. But <laughs> you know, I want some folks to know before I leave this earth. So well, this is some things that I wrote. You know, but but for the most part, this is all I've been doing. It's a beautiful thing. You're bringing it back yeah. to uh, to Hawaii. I know a lot of people are going to be really thrilled. And as you said, dates across the state. Getting started, of course, here in Honolulu at the Blue Note. Hopefully, uh, if you have any free time, maybe I can stop by and just say hi. Maybe we could record a little a little quick thing while you're in Honolulu if it's not a oh, hassle. Please, please do. Please feel free. Did you have fun today? Was this okay? Yeah. <laughs> I hope I really do hope you have fun. It was a huge honor to get you back on the air and to be part of the show, Melvin. Um, means thank a, you, thank you. Uh, I'm world. looking forward to seeing you guys over there and bringing a wonderful show. And I just uh, want all the fans to come out and hear what hear what we're doing, where we are now, especially with John K joining us. And you brought you're going to rent a Hammond here, huh? You're, don't tell me you're lugging one of those things over with. You. Oh no 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 no! They they have something for, and it's not a B three. Uh, I don't know why. There's no B3s over there. If it is, no one seemed to know it. Because if I played Hawaii probably a long time ago, and there was no B3. So uh, it's it's not a B3, what I was told. But, but it is a Hammond. They do have, it is a Hammond, and they do have a Leslie. Yep, they do have the Leslies. One time we had Booker T in our studio here. We had to rent two Leslies and a Hammond for him. He had one on either side of the studio. <laughs> it was really uh 
You actually had a B3 in the studio? I don't know if it was a B3. It was a Hammond, but I'm saying for, for Booker T, okay. we had the Hammond. Yeah. I think, I, I don't know which model, but it was a Hammond, and then he had not one but two Leslies wired up. Okay. Well, I do that. I On stage, I, I, my core requirement is two Leslies. Nice. Okay, so there'll be two at this show, too. Yeah, yeah, should be two. Uh, uh, I believe they told me it'd be two Leslie, but it's not a B3, so... So I'm saying if it sounds a little different, that's why. (laughs) (laughs) Aloha, everybody. It's Melvin Seal. And you may know me from the Jerry Garcia Band. But I am also a fan of this show, All Things Considered. And this guy, Dave Lawrence. Folks, it ain't free. So please make a pledge now and thank you for your support. You're an animal. I couldn't have done it better myself. (laughs) <laughs> hugs you. high fives you're welcome and uh i'll i'll reach out to your people and figure out how to get in touch with you at the show and um i can't wait to see you. i'm giving you a giant hug and i appreciate it you told some fascinating stories provided a lot of insight and um i really do appreciate it moment thank you so much i look to see you over there i'll see you soon travel safe my brother All right. Bye-bye now. god bless